Good morning, <clears throat> uh, Yatath. This is Peter Desmond the third again. I'm going to read chapter two of Hastin Kla, Navajo Medicine Man and Sand Painter. Okay, so this book, this book can be purchased from Amazon. I just wanted to share this with you all. I read this book in college. And uh, a lot of good details about Navajo people who live on the eastern side of the Chishkai Mountain that runs north and south between Arizona and uh, New Mexico, right on the border. Okay. So this is the Newcomb side. Tsenastit. I'm having a hard time. Tsenastit. Okay on the east side of uh, the Chishka Mountain. So here we go. So chapter two, defensive strategy. Chapter one was about uh, Narbona and how he becomes chief. Okay, so I hope you enjoy this uh, book. Again, you can purchase this on Amazon. I did check, look it up. Okay, so here we go. Sometime in the early 1820s, a drought seared the Navajo country. How many years it lasted, I do not know. But in the spring of the third year, Narbona decided to move his family and the remainder of the flocks and herd to central Arizona, where he heard there was still water and grass. All of his menage, his workers, and the majority of the Navajos living in his territory accompanied him on this trek. It must have been difficult, tiresome journey as Sheep travel slowly and must be given time to graze along the way. We have no map of his route, but there was a halt in the Ganado Valley to allow the livestock to graze and the people to rest. Here, one of his sons took a Navajo bride and was given a number of sheep and horses as he wished to remain with his wife's family. Miguelito of Red Point claimed to be descendant of this couple and therefore Claw's cousin. This main safari continued westward into Hopi country, skirting the first, second, and third mesas on which were the Hopi villages whose inhabitants were not exactly friendly to the Navajos. But the company was too large to attack, and there were no hostile demonstrations. Just beyond the third mesa, they came to an enormously wide valley through the center of which flowed a good-sized stream. There were many, there may have been a few Navajo families living in the valley. At least there were no Hopi fields or flocks. Here Narbonne established his domain. This wide valley still carries the name Dinepa. It's a hard word to pronounce because it's not necessarily uh, the way uh, it's written in Navajo. Dinepa Wash. Navajo water, so I have to sound it out, okay? Uh, it's not spelled the way we typically see it in Navajo. At that time, there were several large springs which gushed from the base of Third Mesa on the east and from Minicopi Mesa on the west to furnish water for people, stock grazing, and irrigation of extensive cornfields. Just what arrangements Narbona made with the nearest Hopi chief is not known, but it is supposed that he paid with sheep and horses for rights to the land and so maintained friendly relations with his neighbors. During the eight or nine days this band of Navajos lived in Hopi territory, Narbona's children were growing into adults. Two of his sons and one daughter were married to Hopis. His daughter, uh, Cheya Indeshpa and her Hopi husband, Ayan, Ayan Kin, Kini, or Claw's grandparents. These two lived with the Navajo group. The brothers who had been married to Hopi girls were given sheep and horses by their father and land holdings by the girlfriends, the girl's father, so they could settle by the Hopi village. When Narbona heard that the rains and the snows had returned to the to Nietzsche Mountains, he decided to return his to his former home 
All of his Navajo followers were delighted to be on their way to mountains where there were pine and spruce trees, cedar and pinyon, as trees were few in the Arizona Valley. Valley. The homeward journey was made in three weeks since there were not too many sheep or goats on this return trip and the party took a shorter route. They arrived in Neyetseya in time to start planting their fields and the summer was spent in building a, building a new hogan, corrals and dikes for the fields and, the repairing, and repairing the irrigation ditches. They extended their fields and built diversion dams of adobe as they had acquired much useful knowledge about farming from their Hopi neighbors. By autumn, this group were comfortably established in their home territory and wishing to build back the flocks and herds they had lost during the drought. They started organized raids against the Mexican ranchers lying in the fertile valleys north of Santa Fe. They took any goats, sheep, mules, cattle, and horses they could locate and they kidnapped young women and children when they could do so without much danger to themselves. Their greatest joy came when they were able to liberate a Navajo slave. The Mexican ranchers had many slaves from various tribes, but the Navajos worked the best and were considered the most valuable. Some of these were satisfied with the treatment they received at the hands of their captors and refused to return for their own to their own tribe. They were termed enemy Navajos. <clears throat> for many years, the history of New Mexico is a record of Navajo raids against all pueblos and ranchers, government encouragement of forays and expeditions into Navajo territory, groups of Navajos betrayed and slaughtered by Mexicans, Hickorias, and Taos, and treaties made and broken by both sides. In the fall of 1835, many Mexican ranchers and a troop of soldiers under the command of Captain Hinofos decided to march into Navajo country, destroy their fields, kill or scatter their flocks, burn their hogans, and shoot as many of their people as they could find. There were more than 300 in the Corps. Since most of the leading men of the northern New Mexico joined the expedition, they did not expect the least resistance from the Navajo Indians who were thought to be divided into small groups of raiders who could never make a stand against a much larger force, but they reckoned without Chief Narbona. As this was harvest season, with most of the corn, beans, melons, and squash still ripening in the fields, it would mean starvation for many Navajo families if three or four hundred horses and mules trampled the crops underfoot. Having been informed of the approach of this war party while it was still in the Hamas Mountains, where the crops had reached the headwaters, where the Corps had reached the headwaters of the Rio Chaco and were following this stream in order to be assured of water for horses and men. Arbona had time to collect his warriors and prepare a surprise defense. Chief Narbona assembled 200 warriors, most of them young men who were eager to earn honors in battle. A few of them carried muskets, but the majority were armed with long war bows and iron tipped arrows. In the Museum of Navajo Ceremonial Arts in Santa Fe, there is a war bow and arrows that were probably carried by Navajo warrior in this affair. All the Navajos were mounted bareback on their swiftest horses, and many had painted their faces with red ochre. Since in order for the arrows to be effective, the marksmen must come to fairly close quarters with the enemy. An am ambush was planned at the big bend of the Rio Chaco. Here, a high headland of sandstone hid the warriors until the approaching raiders turned the, turned the bend and were almost upon them. For an amount of this affair, I quote from Josiah Gregg's Commerce of the Prairies. Chapter 15, Wild Tribes of New Mexico. And this is an excerpt from that writing. The Valiant Corps, utterly unconscious of the reception that awaited them, soon came jogging along a scattered groups, in scattered groups, indulging in every kind of boisterous mirth. When the war whoop 
loud and shrill, followed by several shots through them all into a state of speechless consternation. Some tumbled off their horses with fright. Others fired their muskets at random. A terrific panic had seized everybody, and some minutes elapsed before they could recover their senses sufficiently to be take themselves to their heels. Two or three persons were killed in this ridiculous engagement, the most conspicuous of whom was Captain Hinofos, who commanded the regular troops. This victory was almost too easy to suit many of the younger Navajo warriors who were eager to pursue the retreating army and gather a few scalps, but Narbona refused to allow further pursuit, for he well knew the superior number of guns might reverse the victory if the Mexicans made a firm stand. The Mexican raiders were allowed to retreat, taking their dead and wounded with them. The young warriors were also disappointed in the animals they had captured as the greater number were old, raw-boned army mules, discards from the troop station near Santa Fe, which this expedition had used as pack animals. The few horses they captured were highly prized, but as many informant but as my informant stated, the mules were so old and tough they would hardly make good stew meat. However, there is little the Navajos did not put on to use. The mules' hides uh, furnished the toughest leather for making saddles and drums. There was still a goodly bit of loot to be divided since the packs on the mules contained more than half the supplies the Corps had started with. There were blankets, canteens, food supplies, powder and shot, and even an occasional musket still held in the gun boot strap to a saddle. It was a wily, hilarious convoclade of Navajos who returned to their homes in the Tunisia Valley, driving the captured horses and mules and shouting defiance to all enemies of the Navajo tribe. The members of the invading army returned to their homes quite disheartened, disheartened to tell of being beset by thousands of painted warriors and barely escaping with their lives. No more expeditions were sent into the Navajo country from that direction until United States soldiers were stationed in Santa Fe. In the Tunisia Valley, Valley, a war ceremonial was organized as soon as possible in which each warrior, young or old, enacted his own glorious part in the successful encounter. Navajos came from far and wide to attend this war dance, and news of the victory spread to every corner of the Navajo territory, and also the Pueblo villages and Mexican haciendas. Nar Narbona's name brought fear to his enemies, but more and more Navajo families came to live on the eastern slopes of the Chushka Mountains and swell the number of his followers. The young warriors, believing themselves invincible, raided in all directions until every pueblo and every rancheria became a fortress with all their inhabitants fearing and hating the Navajos. When the corn was ripe in the fall of the summer, rains had filled arroyos and water holes. The ceremonial season began. Now the sheep were fat and food was plentiful. The Navajos gathered around evening fires near the fields where during the day they had been busy husking corn flailing beans and cutting squash and pumpkins into long stripes to dry in the clear autumn air. Boys and young men formed a circle surrounding a drum and rehearsed the plan planti planative chants they would sing at the next Yebiche. Everyone would have been very happy and content if it had not been for the ever-present threat of raiders. This harvest, this harvesting activity was well known to the enemy tribes to the north and east. If they could send raiding parties to catch the Navajos unaware, they could capture many slaves and horses. As the lowlands of the Tunisia Valley were now widely cultivated, they became the main targets of raiders from, the, from these two directions. About six or seven miles north of the area, there rises a large mass of volcanic rock, which the Navajos call Cis, cis not Jin, Black Rock. The name on the map is Bennett Peak. From the top of this, the lower country can be scanned for many miles in every direction. To the southeast, 
a red butte rears its crest high above the surrounding land on 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 these high points in our bonus station watchers to flash smoke signals by day or fire flashes at night to warn the workers in the fields of approaching enemies. This gave Narbona time in which to gather a formidable war troop, arrange an ambush, and pretty well annihilate the raiders. After a few disastrous forays, the Utes and Apaches decided to turn their efforts toward other Navajo communities and the Tinucha Valley was left in peace. There is one tale of a Comanche war party that followed the San Juan River until they came to the mouth of the Rio Chaco, where they turned south into the Navajo country. The Comanches were excellent horsemen and owned beautiful horses, the envy of all Navajo raiders. This band of raiders numbered about 20 young Indians led by a son of their chieftain, all mounted on their fleetest ponies. Again, the Navajos were warned of approaching enemies and planned an ambush many miles down the valley where it would least be expected. In this encounter, more than half of the Comanches were killed and their raider remainder fled, leaving their dead behind, taking only the body of the chief's son. Among the horses captured by the Navajos was a beautiful roan stallion that had been ridden by the chieftain's son and his horse Narbona claimed as his prize. It is remembered as being a large horse of a light roan color with brownish spots on its rump and shoulders. It was probably the first Appaloosa ever owned by a Navajo. Okay, that concludes chapter two of Hostine Claw uh, defensive strategy. So I just went through and talked about the what had happened and how uh, Narbona was able to sit on top of uh, mesas and um, volcanic rock. So that they were warm. Okay, so again, if you enjoy this story, please uh, follow. In the upcoming episodes, I'll read uh, the remainder of this uh, book. Uh, you know, again, like I said, a lot of good information in here, and a lot. It, it talks a lot about the the history of Navajo people from the perspective of a uh, of an Anglo Anglo um, trading post owner. Okay, in, in the Newcomb area. Um, again, my name is Peter Desert. Thank you for uh, listening to this or watching this. Now, thank you. Bye bye.